Hi everybody, it's Camille. Let's talk about thyroid hormones today. So we oftentimes hear people talk about thyroid hormone as if it's just one hormone, but it turns out there's actually two hormones that are collectively referred to as thyroid hormone. That, those would be T3 and T4. So T3 is triiodothyronine and T4 is thyroxine. They're both produced by the thyroid gland in the neck and they have similar actions, but they're not quite the same. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I want to talk to you about how we regulate thyroid hormone levels to start out with. This is a classic negative feedback system. So if you're familiar with those, this should be old hat. When thyroid hormone levels get a little bit low in the blood, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary detect that and say, hmm, I think we need to stimulate the thyroid gland to produce a little bit more thyroid hormone. Without thyroid hormone, we die, so it's very important that we regulate it pretty carefully. So the hypothalamus produces thyrotropin-releasing hormone, which travels just via a portal vein, so just from one capillary bed to another, a teeny, teeny distance into the anterior pituitary gland, and that TRH stimulates thyrotropes in that pituitary gland to make thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH. TSH is released into the systemic circulation, meaning you can measure it in a blood test, and from there it goes to the thyroid gland and stimulates the production of T3 and T4. As levels go up, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary detect that, and they can downregulate TRH and TSH production so that you're not continually stimulating the thyroid gland, and you just find this happy medium where thyroid hormone levels go a little up and a little down and they're regulated in this way. Once T3 and T4 are released into the blood, they are, well, they're always <laughs> fat soluble. And in the blood, if they are not bound to a protein, they wouldn't last very long. They would just diffuse out of the bloodstream or they would get excreted by the kidneys. So in order to prevent that from happening, they travel via taxi, <laughs> which is a proteins. They are attached to proteins produced by the liver, primarily a thyroxine binding globulin, but also albumin and a number of other things to a certain degree. So when these thyroid hormones are bound up to these taxis, they're inactive. They can't affect any changes in the cells. Um, so there's a very small fraction of T3 and T4 that will be free. And that is the part, that's, those are the hormones that can actually cause change in the tissue. Um, and then the, what's bound up to these proteins is basically a reserve. So as some of that free T3 and T4 gets used up a little bit more, will disassociate from these protein taxis and become free and so forth. Now, the next question you may have is, what are they actually doing when they, when they do effect change? And uh, T3 is our more active hormone. Uh, they, both can, they both can affect these changes, but primarily T3 is at least four times as active as T4, if not more, depending on what studies you're looking at. Um, so these hormones, when they're free, they can come into the cells. Pretty much any cell has a thyroid thyroid hormone receptors on the nucleus, and they bind to these receptors and essentially put the pedal to the metal. They activate the gas pedal in the cells. So anything that that cell does, it's going to do it more <laughs> under the influence of thyroid hormone. So um, they increase metabolic activity by increasing glucose oxidation, stimulate carbohydrate and fat metabolism, increase the number of mitochondria, increase the number of adrenergic receptors on blood vessels, which if you remember correctly, um, is involved in blood pressure regulation and so forth. Now, the next question that I want to answer for you is how we make thyroid hormone. And I think this is a really interesting process. So thyroid hormone is produced in the thyroid gland, and the thyroid gland is in the neck, and it's made up of a bunch of thyroid follicles. So it's basically these thyroid cells surrounding a little glob of colloid, and there's all these different follicles throughout the thyroid gland. So these blue cells here are thyroid cells, and then the red circle is a cross-section of a blood vessel. In order to make thyroid hormone, you need iodine, and you get that from your diet, hopefully. <laughs> so we eat foods that are iodine rich. The iodine is transported as iodide in the blood, and the thyroid cells actively recruit, they actively pull in that iodide. 
via this sodium iodide symporter, or the NIS, you'll sometimes see it called. So it's pulled in here to the thyroid cell, and it actually travels right through the cell and out the other end via this pendrin transporter. Um, and once the iodide is out into the colloid, so it, now it's in this dark pink part right here, once it's in the colloid, it's going to hook up with something called thyroglobulin. That is a, just a long chain of tyrosine, essentially, that's produced in the thyroid cell itself and then excreted into the colloid via exocytosis. So you have all of these, each one of these little um, things here is a tyrosine residue. So once the iodine is pumped into the colloid, it's converted back into iodine by oxidation, so taking off an electron, and then that iodine is added on to the tyrosine. This is all happening, uh, facilitated by an enzyme called thyroid peroxidase, or TPO. And if you work with people who have hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, many of them will have antibodies to that particular enzyme. So what's happening when we add the iodine to tyrosine? Here's a tyrosine right up here in the corner. That's tyrosine. So we can add one iodine. This is something called monoiodotyrosine, or MIT. Or we can add two. Here we have one, two iodines added. That's diiodotyrosine. Um, and we, we can keep on building, because the next thing that can happen is these tyrosines can actually combine. So if we combine an MIT and a DIT, we will wind up with three iodines, right? One, two, three. That's called T3. That's a combination of MIT and DIT, or T3. And over here we've got two DITs added together, so we've got one, two, three, four iodines, and that is what's known as T4. So all of this is happening here in the colloid. And all of this thyroid hormone is formed and stored here, and we should have enough uh, what they call reserve in the thyroid gland to last uh, up to several months, potentially. And this is just hanging out here, waiting to be told we need more thyroid hormone in the blood. And at that point, when TSH comes along and binds to this thyroid cell, telling the thyroid cell, hey, TS TSH is saying, hey, thyroid hormone levels are a little low. I think we could use a little bit more in the blood. What will happen is this process of endocytosis, where some of the colloid will be kind of sucked back into the thyroid cell, forms a little, um, vessel here, a vesicle, and lysosomes in this vesicle will clip off the T3 and the T4, and then it, of course because it's fat soluble it will diffuse into the bloodstream and circulate there. You can imagine that T4 is a little bit easier to form, and it's also more stable. So most of what we're secreting into the blood is T4. It's a smaller percentage of T3. But remember what I said about how T3 is actually the active form. So T4 lasts a lot longer in the blood, but T3 is really what we want if we want to stimulate the cells in the way that we've been talking about. So how does that happen? Well, it's really interesting. Um, clearly, in order to go from T4, right, T4 over here, to T3, what we need to do is take one of the iodines off, right? Like that's pretty simple. That's the only difference between these two things. But the question is, how do we do that? Uh, conveniently, <laughs> there are enzymes called deiodinase enzymes, which you can see on this chart here. And these deiodinase enzymes are actually produced by the target cells, the tissues themselves, where these thyroid hormones take effect. For the most part, there are some exceptions to that rule. Uh, and what so what these deiodinase enzymes do is pluck off an iodine. And it's really interesting because some of the deiodinases will activate T4, as you see up here, into T3. So if you pluck off this particular iodine, then you can convert T4 into T3. However, if you take off the other iodine here on the inner ring, you actually make something called reverse T3, which is inactive. So the cell itself, depending on which deiodinase it expresses, can basically choose to a certain degree um, what type of thyroid hormone stimulation it might need at that particular point.
So very interesting. Then you can continue to deiodinate uh, by taking off even more iodines, which will inactivate. So right here you can see another, if you pluck off another in, uh, iodine, then you've got a T2, which is not active. And over here you can do the same thing with um, reverse T3, and then those will just get metabolized and excreted. So I think I really like this concept of the cells themselves having some agency over uh, what, how thyroid hormone is going to affect them. Um, one of the interesting things about these deiodinase enzymes is that they are selenium dependent. And this is one of the reasons that selenium is a really important nutrient for thyroid health. It's not because it's necessarily directly related to the thyroid gland itself, but it's important for activating T4 into T3 at the tissue level. So if you, have, you can have all the T4 in the world, but if you haven't got enough selenium to efficiently run these deiodinase enzymes, then you may not effectively be receiving enough thyroid hormone stimulation at the cellular level. So selenium is a really interesting nutrient for that reason. All right, I hope that helps clarify some things about the thyroid gland for you, and do let me know if you have any questions.